No, I Progress. They're recording, but I'm not. I'm muted. Oh, man. I'm not on the right side of the screen. What? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Darina Petrovsky, and I am the uh, Emerging Scholar and Professional Organization Chair. Uh, welcome to the webinar focused on ways to support early career scholars across the Gentological Society of America and Alzheimer Association, I start. Just a few grant rules. Uh, please uh, keep yourself on mute. Um, until our Q&A session. Um, if you have entered as Gina, as a clone of our GSA staff, Gina Schoen, um, please rename yourself uh, by clicking, um, hovering over your name under the participants and clicking on more and then rename. Um, so this way we know, um, even though I'm sure there are other Gina Showens out there. Um, that way we know who we're talking to. Um, so the way that we'll have the webinar today, I'll go ahead and start and talk about um, different ways that we at ESPO um, um, support our early career scholars. And then, um, then Beth uh, will take over and talk about the ways that Alzheimer's Association ISTAR support, support supports, I'm sorry, their early career scholars, and then followed by Naira, who's gonna um, uh, add more to, um, to the discussion on how Alzheimer Association supports um, their scholars. Um, so welcome. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, talk a little first about um, our uh, 2021 um, officers uh, for ESPO and introduce ourselves. Um, then I'm gonna follow up with um, some of the activities and the future directions of ESPO. And then um, last, I'm gonna finish up with uh, talking about um, the annual scientific meeting that's coming up and all the ESPO events that are scheduled um, ahead of that meeting and then during that meeting. Um, so in our governance, uh, there are four of us um, who are in charge of putting together ESPO programming, making sure everything is happening as it should, um, and thinking about and sort of leading our um, organization. Um, this is, we are on a four year um, terms. Uh, so I'm currently in my third year as chair. And so first we're elected as vice chair elect, and then we proceed into a vice chair, chair, and then past chair positions. And within each of that year, we have different responsibilities and tasks um, that we do and accomplish. So I just want to emphasize that it is um, a team effort. Um, and then the four of us, along with the GSA staff, um, who is Gina, we meet monthly um, um, to discuss anything that's happening and anything that we need to address. Um, yes, so um, next I'm going, I know this slide is a bit busy, but I think it's meant to show of how inclusive and how big of an of a organization that we are. We currently have about uh, 1,200, I believe in 50 um, active ESPO members. So those who designate ESPO as one of their um, scientific section and who are active um, within the Gerontological Society of America. So that is a pretty large organization. We've, we have certain uh, work groups and task forces uh, within ESPO um, leadership that really help us drive a lot of the initiatives and activities um, that we do. So on the left, you'll see that um, um, Danny, who is our um, rising uh, chair for ESPO, leads the annual scientific meeting working group. And that group really starts um, their activities as soon as our annual scientific meeting um, is over in December. So from December till about March of when the abstracts are due, um, this work group works on um, special symposia um, that are under the helm of um, ESPO and then puts together that programming. 
Uh, we also have um, many awards um, that are designated for early career members. And Jamie, who is our past chair, leads that uh, review panel. Um, so the applications for the awards are reviewed by early career scholars. And then um, our another task force that we have is related to communications, uh, which I think is similar um, to the I start that there is a communications um, chair or lead. lead lead in that case. Um, in air communication, as you may imagine, we um, we do a lot of work, obviously, with answering um, uh, ESPA members' concerns via email. There's also, we have a column in our monthly um, um, newsletter that comes out from GSA. Um, so there's always lots of things that are happening uh, with communications. We unfortunately did not yet have a very strong presence on uh, Twitter. We don't have our own handle, um, but that is something that we're looking to do um, in the future. Uh, we also have a dissertation uh, writing room task force. Um, so back a few years ago, uh, we, when talking with our um, students as well as transitional members, we found out that, that a lot of our students, especially who are in the dissertation writing um, stage of their um, studies, um, express the need to have some sort of an organized way to uh, help each other be accountable and help each other sort of get to that um, uh, you know, starting at that PhD candidate level all the way to uh, finished. Um, and so we have a number of um, uh, dissertation writing groups. So we have a task force that oversees um, those activities. Um, we also have a small but mighty international task force that we're, uh, we're looking for ways um, to expand. Um, and that task force addresses specific needs of international um, student members within the GSA, um, and they're usually uh, very active. Um, the webinar task force, I would say, is probably our flagship program, if we can call it that, um, which started a few years back, even before um, GSA um, was doing a lot of webinars on their own, and this is definitely pre-pandemic. Uh, um, we used to have and still have two webinars um, um, in the spring and in the fall, uh, which are usually geared towards topic related to career development um, for early career members. Um, so that's something that has, something that has been in, in existence for a while and, and we always look for ways to um, expand these programs as well. Um, in addition to our task forces, um, uh, ESPO is a scientific section uh, within the Gerontological Society of America. But in addition to ESPO, there are, all, there are five, right, five additional scientific sections. So one focusing on um, uh, acad uh, gerontological higher education, uh, one focused on behavioral and social sciences, um, biological sciences, health sciences, and social research policy and practice. Um, so each of our ESPA members can belong to more than one scientific section. For, so for, for me, for example, I belong to ESPO, obviously, and then um, to health sciences. I'm a nurse uh, by training and consider myself um, being part of that section. Um, and so what we have created is uh, volunteer positions that give our uh, ESPA volunteers an opportunity to work with senior leadership with each, within each of these scientific sections to get to know, um, you know, what are they doing? Uh, what are their uh, priorities? You know, how do they address the needs of early career members within each of the scientific sections? So um, we build a model of sort of co-led um, um, junior and senior leaders. And these are appointed for two year terms. So the first year you really get to know the in and out of um, workings um, of each of the scientific section. And then year two, you get to do all these things that you learned about in year one, and you get to train um, a junior leader to you know, replace you that, that following year. Um, and these have been tremendous opportunities for our school leadership. These positions are, tend to be a little more time intensive, not as time intensive as 
um, leadership um, section officer positions, but still, um, you know, give you that exposure to senior leadership that you would otherwise not get. Um, there are several strategic priorities that we set for ESPO 2021, um, the main being uh, freeing ourselves of biases related and finding ways to combat um, health and uh, inequities uh, that are currently present um, in our society. And so there's a number of programming that we had this in the, just in the last six months um, that looked at ways to uh, better ourselves, to educate ourselves, and to have platforms to really talk about these issues um, as they arise. As I mentioned, the task forces, um, uh, they, they hold uh, the online dissertation writing groups, and there is a uh, a sort of progress being made right now to expand these dissertation writing groups, not just for students, uh, but also transitional members, those who have uh, finished their PhD or postdocs or early career faculty, um, to have a, some sort of um, formal slash informal way to keep each other accountable um, in, in writing. As I mentioned, uh, we have uh, regular webinars. Um, as well as regular newsletter that comes out um, from me every month uh, to all of our members, as well as additional e-communications uh, in our newsletter. And of course, we have our international task force, which um, in the pre-pandemic would hold uh, meetings at the annual scientific meeting in order to um, help our international members uh, find out what is happening at the annual scientific meeting and also as a way to network as well. And then here's our email and we'll have that in our follow-up email to this uh, webinar, which is pretty easy to remember, which is espo at jaren.org. Um, I check that pretty regularly as well as all of our um, communications leads do as well. Um, so I'm going to finish up and I'm just going to talk about several um, networking and educational events that are usually held at their annual scientific meeting. This year, um, the annual scientific meeting, um, similar, I think, to Alzheimer's Association annual scientific uh, gathering will be held simultaneously in person as well as um, online. So it'll be a sort of a hybrid event. So in preparation for that, we have several informal chats that will be happening. And we think of our informal chats as a way to connect with early career peers in a more of an, an informal setting. And we hold those prior to the annual scientific meeting and during the annual scientific meeting. Um, and pre-pandemic, we would gather in a, you know, in a hotel room, in a conference room, and then um, in a more sort of relaxed atmosphere uh, with uh, you know, drinks and, and food and such. And that really provided us a way to just get to talk to each other, which was quite different from sort of formal symposia and presentations that would be usually part of a, a large scientific meeting. Within the scientific meeting, we also have several special ESPO designated symposia. Um, some of them you have to submit an abstract for and sort of apply to be designated at such a symposium. Our flagship and biggest event is the presidential symposium. Um, and then last but not least, for those of you who are in the United States, you may be familiar with the Butler Williams um, program, Summer Institute, uh, that is funded and provided by the National Institute on Aging. So in the past few years, what we've done is we've partnered with the NIA um, leadership um, to put together a symposium of Butler Williams alumni. Um, and that some program is very competitive. Um, and so what we've tried to do is to connect the alums of the program with um, folks who may be interested in applying for the program. Um, and also as a way to start conversations with those um, maybe who are just a little bit ahead of us in terms of career development um, as well. Um, here's a snapshot of the 2021 dissertation writing group schedule. We have um, three sessions. So the next session is starting up um, will be in the fall of 2021 and the registration for that will be open in um, July. And then uh, in the follow-up email, we'll also include a link uh, to where you can look more into these programs and where you can sign up or encourage your mentees or colleagues um, to sign up. 
And then my last slide uh, is uh, talking about the 2021 annual scientific meeting, which will take place in Phoenix, Arizona in the United States in mid-November. Um, and the theme of that conference will be disruption to transformation, aging, and the new normal. And registration for that will open soon. ESPA members um, um, have uh, a discounted rate uh, for the conference. In addition to that, we also try to help um, those maybe who are coming by themselves or who may not know other people who are coming to the conference to find roommates. Um, and uh, you know to be able to save money on some of the lodging. Um, so um, with that, I will pass the baton over to Beth. Okay, hi everybody. It's so uh, great to see you all. Um, I see some familiar names on the call. It's really um, great to see that. And I'm a member of both the GSA and um, I start. And so this is really great to see uh, my worlds come together. So um, Nayara and I will be presenting information about the International Society to Advance Alzheimer's Research and Treatment or I start. And I'll give a general overview of iStart, and then Nayara will talk specifically about our professional interest area for early career researchers, which is known as peers. Oops. Okay, so iStart has over 3,000 members from over 65 countries around the world. And those uh, members really run the gamut in terms of career stage from students all the way on up to advanced career faculty. And the activities and benefits that um, are available through iStart membership um, to early career researchers include conferences, webinars, and publications. And we really go about um, providing those benefits through our professional interest areas. And this is sort of a schematic giving an overview of how you might think of the organization of the professional interest areas or PIAs. So in the bottom left corner, you have uh, supporting researchers professionally and personally. And that's where you'll see peers, the PIA to elevate early career researchers along with two others, Alliance of Women Alzheimer's Researchers, or AWARE, and the Diversity and Disparities PIA, which actually you'll see again in a moment falls under another um, topic domain. And so this is really supporting things um, like career development, mentoring, um, and other aspects of personal and professional development. The second area is in the top left. It's understanding the types of dementia and contributing factors. And so just a few examples of PIAs that fall under that umbrella are atypical Alzheimer's disease, Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. This is where diversity and disparities PIA shows up again. Um, and then for example, vascular cognitive disorders. The third area is in the top right. This is assessing markers and manifestations of disease progression. And this includes PIAs like the biofluid-based biomarkers, PIA, and design and data analytics, neuroimaging, cognition. The final subject area is in the bottom right, and this is intervening to improve outcomes. This includes three PIAs, the clinical trials, advancement, and methods PIA, and the non-pharmacological interventions and health policy PIA. So altogether, there are 27 professional interest areas that when you join iStart, you choose which PIAs you would like to be specifically involved with. Um, in, in GSA, this is akin to sort of the interest groups. So for example, the, uh, the ADRD group, the um, epidemiology of aging group and the brain interest group, for example, in GSA, these are sort of their counterparts in iStart. Um, in terms of conferences, iStart members receive reduced registration fees for association meetings. Um, for example, for AAIC, the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, our annual meeting, um, there's presently uh, for virtual attendance, 
uh, iStart members attend free. Um, and when it's a normal in-person year or this year, if you were attending in person, you also do get a reduced registration fee as a member. And then um, early career researchers are eligible uh, for the iStart student and postdoc volunteer programs if, if they're an iStart member. So for example, this year, if you had applied for this program and you were able to attend the in-person portion of AAIC, you would then volunteer and then you would get the cost of registration and um, travel um, and accommodations covered. Uh, there are preferential deadlines. Um, so for example, you get an extended deadline to submit your abstract for AAIC. And you also get access to um, iStart member only receptions and other events. In addition, um, Coming up in October, there will be an online meeting called Neuroscience Next. The whole purpose of this meeting is to highlight the work of students and other early career researchers. Um, this meeting is free for everyone to attend, but iStart members get extended virtual access. So you can continue to log into the site and look at the materials that have been shared there, the talks and posters and so forth for an extended period of time. And then PIA members can submit um, abstracts for featured research sessions and PIA-led sessions. So this is the equivalent in um, GSA of submitting a symposium essentially. And then the PIA executive committee members can lead the submission of those uh, featured research sessions. We can curate scientific sessions at our scientific meetings that are pre-conferences and professional interest area days. Uh, we organize mentoring events and vote for award winners. In regards to webinars, um, similar to what Darina was explaining, we, we do have a weekly email that goes out to members and this highlights all of the upcoming events. So um, things that we've been doing lately in iStart include journal club in which um, an early career researcher uh, presents a, a journal article along with the author or a couple of authors of the paper. Uh, you can attend the iStart guide to AAIC and that will be coming up soon actually. And that's just a way to get oriented to what to expect at AAIC. Um, there's also access to, to PIA primers, research updates, and also uh, several of the PIAs do years in review. So what's the summary of what's been going on in, in either that area, subject area, or in the PIA during the past year. Um, in terms of PIA members, there may be calls for presenters for webinars when we do webinars, and then the executive committee members also lead organization of these webinars. And finally, with regard to publications, there are several uh, benefits that members get, and that includes an online subscription to Alzheimer's and Dementia, the primary journal, and then also reduce publication fees. So 20% off for, for Alzheimer's and dementia, but then 50% off for the two sister publications. Uh, PIA members can take part in calls for co-authors. So sometimes the PIA groups especially tend to get together and do a group paper, a summary of proceedings of meetings or some kind of white paper. So you can take part in calls for co-authors when that is occurring. And then the executive committee would lead those publications. And one benefit for us as um, in the PIAs is that we then get waived publication fees for these PIA-led publications, one per year, um, if they're published in the Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal family. And so I'm gonna stop there. I'm happy to answer questions once it comes to that section. And I'm gonna, or I'm gonna turn this over to um, Nayara. And I'm just remembering that we, decided that we were going to, um, I would keep sharing my screen. So Nayara, take it away. Thanks, Beth. Um, hi, so I'm Nayara Demnitz. I'm an early career researcher. I'm a postdoc working in healthy brain aging. Um, and like Beth, I'm a member of iStart and a member of the PIA to elevate early career researchers. So this is, um, which is abbreviated as PEERS. And this is um, our professional interest area, our group that has been focusing on um, bringing early career researchers together. 
when and then forming this group. So um, the aim of this PIA is to um, bring these, to bring early career researchers who work in the area of dementia, um, to allow them to network um, and to establish a really supportive group for these individuals. So Beth, if, yeah, exactly. And one more. Thank you. Um, so I think what we wanted to say is that we are quite a new um, group. We are less than a year old, um, but we have accumulated quite a few members. So at the moment, or at least as of last Friday, um, we had over 170 members coming from over 25 countries. Um, and included in these 170 members, we had our executive committee. So similar to, um, to in the GSA, the groups have these executive committees um, where you have a chair, a vice chair, a communications chair. Um, but on top of that, we also have a, um, we also have continent leads from each continent with the exception of Antarctica, um, because we felt very passionate of having global representation in our executive committee as well. The idea here being that we wanted to ensure that the aims and programs and targets that we were developing were also um, rep representing the challenges and aims that early career researchers working in dementia had in each one of those continents. Um, so that's our executive committee. Um, and as I said, we're quite new, but we've started now, um, we're quite an ambitious group as well, and we've started to develop a few projects, an example of which is the Methods Club. Um, so the Methods Club is a webinar series um, aimed and aimed at, again, early career researchers, where in each session, we focus on one method that is typically used in dementia research. Here, the example being biofluid biomarkers. And what we do is we have three short talks um, where an early career researcher will come and present the method in and how they use it in their field. Um, and we'll have those three short talks. And in addition to that, we also invite um, a couple of senior researchers from that field to come and um, answer questions at the end. The idea here being that we have a mix of the different levels of career stages so that we can attract people who are there to, um, to network, but also people who want to come and learn from the early career researchers and from the senior researchers. Um, I should say that this was our very first webinar. Um, it will become online in about two weeks if you, um, if you are interested in it. But also, most importantly, we hope to be recording a few more. So if this is something that um, you're interested in or have some ideas for, please do get in touch, um, especially if you have a method that you think, you know, there's a lot happening in it um, and it would be really helpful to have a sort of a discussion around it. Um, please do get in touch. Um, so that's an example of our, uh, this webinar series. But we also have a few um, projects and outputs that we're planning, so some upcoming events. For example, at the annual uh, meeting of the Alzheimer's Association, which is called the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, um, which will be happening at the end of July, um, our group, the Early Career Researchers Group, will also be running a series of lunches um, called the Student Workshops. But we are the, the student and postdocs um, and trainees. If you identify as an early career researcher, in essence, you're very welcome to attend. Um, and these will be focused um, on things like public outreach and um, transitioning career stages. Um, and it will, again, be a sort of a less scientific, more about your own personal development. And so please do come along if you are attending the conference. Um, and I would just say that we also have um, an annual scientific session and a business meeting that will be happening in September and a few more webinars lined up for later in the year. Um, and then another big project that we're working on at the moment, um, which is quite exciting, is a global survey of early career researchers in dementia. Um, so the idea here being that we would like to know um, what are the challenges and the difficulties that PhD students, postdocs, trainees are experiencing in their local country in terms of their career transitions in, in terms that are limiting and challenging their research in dementia for in the nation that they are. Um, so we've designed a survey to try and, you know, get some of those experiences. Um, and it will be 
<laughs> it will be released very soon, hopefully, and we will be using our global network to try and spread that and get as much um, international information back from that as possible. And we will also be sharing our completion link with um, the GSA. So it'd be great to get your thoughts on that as well. Um, finally, I should say that to be a member of PEERS, um, you do have to be a member of ISTAT. Um, there is a joint student and postdoc membership that um, is available for $75, um, and that includes the virtual AIC attendance. So it's, it's quite a good deal. Um, there's also reduced rates for those who are in low and middle income countries. Um, so then to, if you then want to join PEERS, um, what you do is you become a member of ISTAT, and then in the PIA's online website, you can then um, select this particular PIA, which is the PIA for early career researchers. Um, and then I just, I know I've said this a lot, but I, I think it, it has been personally one of the biggest advantages, in my opinion, um, has been this global networking that, we, that we've experienced being part of the peers. So it's, it's just been one of these benefits that we've had in this year where it's been so hard to, to communicate and to meet researchers from other areas. Um, and having this, this unit, this group, which is focused on this, has been a great opportunity um, to interact and to meet other researchers from the same career stage as you. Um, and yeah, and we hope to keep some of that and what we've learned in this, um, in the last year and a half, so that we can keep this online engagement um, and keep merging in-person events with online events for future. <laughs> Yeah, so please do let me know if you have any questions. Um, and as I said, we are hoping to um, be creating more in webinars and events like these in the future. So please do get in touch if you're interested. Great, thank you, Nayara and Beth. Um, so this is it for our sort of formal uh, type of a presentation. Um, I see there was a couple of questions, um, I think one or two questions that are being submitted. So we encourage you to submit them uh, via chat. Um, and so the first one comes from um, Preeti and I think I, I see it as a two part question. Um, you know, how do we define early career researchers? A really good question. And um, I'll go first uh, with that and then, um, in terms of the second larger comment, I think I'm not sure if uh, you're suggesting different topics that we could consider um, in our future webinars because it's not really phrased as a question. So if you can clarify that for me, that would be great. Uh, so the first question, um, how do we define early career researchers? So in terms of uh, GSA and ESPO, uh, we define early career members, anybody who is a student member or is a transitional member which is defined as two years uh, post um, your sort of your final or terminal um, degree. However, with that being said, you're correct um, that um, some institutions, um, um, you know, some institutions will consider early career members or how the NIH defines it, I think is uh, those within 10 years uh, of the PhD. So what we've done um, to, because we realize that you know once you be, once you finish your PhD, you still have a lot a lot to learn, and you're still sort of in that middle stage of um, being a postdoc and still learning how to transition to your new role. So what we've done is when you join um, GSA, you can actually um, uh, sign up or become part of ESPO, even if you're sort of beyond that. Um, um, sort of official definition, and that helps uh, our folks have access to a lot of the webinars and the resources and our designated um, connect page that you may not get um, otherwise. And then in addition to that, um, we do track in our, when somebody submits uh, an abstract to our site, to our our annual scientific meeting, um, there is a button on there you can click uh, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, if you have, if you are within 10 years of graduating with a PhD, and that helps us track, um, helps broaden the definition of an early career researcher and helps us track the submissions for early career members in the, um, for the sci annual scientific meeting. So we use that uh, tracker as well. Um, and then Beth Onayar, did you want to talk about um, I start definition of early career researcher? 
Um, in terms of in terms of the the student and postdoc reduced um, price membership, that that's clearly um, student postdoc. Um, however, for our um, professional interest area, <clears throat> excuse me, we go all the way up to early career faculty, and our you know, perspective on this is that we let people self-identify basically as early career researchers, especially because we are dealing um, with all the countries around the world and it's our very strong aim to include everyone. There may be different definitions in different countries. And so we want uh, members of peers to just self-identify that way. Great. Um, I welcome, we welcome any other additional questions. These may be questions related to the programming, to our own experiences, um, being in leadership positions um, in our respective um, institutions. You can also, if you don't want to type, you can um, unmute yourself and then ask a question or raise your hand and then ask a question. There's a lot of genes in the I, I have a question uh, for you, for, for Beth and Ayra. Um, you talked a lot about sort of the global reach, right, uh, of, of PA and I start. Um, and that is something that, um, you know, is, has been a focus of ours, but we find that not a lot of our members ident come from, you know, sort of international backgrounds. And, um, a lot of our SMM members are US based. So how, what kind of efforts did you make? I know this was a goal for you from right from the beginning, but what were some of the outreach or is it just by its own definition that Alzheimer Association is a, you know, it's very um, global sort of, and then it, it takes place in different countries, like the annual scientific meeting takes place in different countries. So how did you, what efforts did you make specifically to reach different continents? That's a great um, point there, Rina because as Beth said, that was a strong aim of ours. Um, I think a huge part of that is due to Alzheimer's Association having already such a strong international basis, um, and that did facilitate it at all, a lot. But I would say that having the continent leads, so having individuals in the executive committee that were representing at least each continent, that was very helpful because they then come with their individual network from that country, and then that spreads to them. Um, it was also very helpful having the meeting online last year, um, mm -hmm. which was free for everyone to attend. And that massively increased its international reach. And then all of a sudden, you know, you had that sort of international exposure with uh, members coming from all over the world. Um, I would also say that Twitter has been <laughs> has been incredibly helpful um, to connect with with um, colleagues from all over the world. And I, I know um, you mentioned it earlier on, and I would say personally, I think it does have a, a strong power to you know, reach outside of our usual academic bubble. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add just um, an extra two cents there that um, I think also we've been very intentional about uh, working through our networks to find um, other early career researchers in other countries. Um, and so when we don't know, you know, investigators in a certain country, we've looked to other um, established career researchers who might know trainees who have gone to that country or who originally were from that country and did training in another country and then went back to their home country to open a lab, for example. Um, or other professional societies who may have a presence in other countries. And so we've been very intentional about seeking out those types of connections as well. Great. Um, there's a question about how can someone volunteer with each of the organizations? Um, so I'll go ahead first since I'm talking. Um, volunteering within GS with uh, GSA and ASPO for me personally has been um, a really tremendous opportunity. I mean, it's, it is a bit of a long haul of a four year commitment of the executive leadership, but even before that I was involved with putting together webinars. Um, so I just wanna 
I think I and I think both Beth and I are will agree that I think this the um, being in a volunteer leadership position has really enhanced um, I think all of our careers in many different ways. In terms of ways to get involved with us, um, upon the, the follow-up email, we'll give you more specific, perhaps, deadlines as we know right now. Um, so for us, there's sort of two different sort of tiers of uh, volunteer. You can sign up at any time to be part of any work group. You just have to let us know and be a current member of ESPO. And then we have uh, twice a year, or I think in summer and fall, usually sometimes that changes, but mainly in the fall, we do a big drive for um, volunteer positions to be in our task forces and um, to be um, you know, junior leaders, as I mentioned in the presentation. So that formation will should come out sometime in the fall. We've, we have yet to determine the exact dates. In addition, um, there's a different call for in, uh, leadership positions, and that usually comes out, I think it came out in the winter, um, or maybe late, early spring, I think it was. Uh, and then we usually hold our elections in the beginning of the summer, um, uh, mid midsummer, and that those are for the executive leadership positions. So sort of two different parts. And what about you guys, Ed? To start. I actually can't comment much on what the um, volunteering opportunities are for ISTAT. I know that they exist and I actually, we have um, one of our members on the executive committee got involved um, in ISTAT and attending the conferences through volunteering um, from Brazil, um, Wagner Brum. Um, but we do have some, um, if, if you enter into the ISTAT website and the Alzheimer's Association, I believe that there's a link for volunteering. I'll post it here on the chat. I think in addition, um, of course, e executive committee members are volunteering their times as, time as well. So the way to um, become involved in that is, um, so as a member of iStart and then you become involved in one of the professional interest areas, um, you'll, you will see each year there is, each year or every other year, there's a there's an election, a call for new um, volunteers to run for various officer positions, and then an election. And I I should say this is a great moment to point out that those those other professional interest areas outside of of peers um, that are focused on other topic areas and on other professional development areas often do have student and postdoc. Um, members on their executive committees as well. And so there really is a lot of opportunity to get involved directly um, with both volunteering and then with also becoming a member of executive committees. Um, and then I will also say that should any of you be interested, you can see in the way that Darina described all sort of those, the task forces, it will be similar as we continue to, to develop as a professional interest area. You know, we need other people who are really interested in doing this work and in understanding what early career researchers needs are um, and what we have an interest in determining what the policies are in different um, countries, for example, as well. And so if you wanna get involved, we would love to have you um, please get in contact with us. I, I know that Gina is going to send a follow-up email after this webinar, so I think you'll have ways to get in touch with all of us. Um, but we will have that need for committee members to also volunteer. So we'd love for you to volunteer with any of us. Just get in touch. Great. Um, next question. Oh, so Nabina asked about how we can be part of GSA. So both... Um, Beth and Gina posted links on how to join um, either or both of, of our organizations. They're posted in the chat. Um, next question, Patricia. Um, hi, Patricia. Um, she's asking in terms of what are some of the initiatives that are in place in each of our organizations to support mid-career development and funding programs um, um, in the comment that there seems to be a lot of focus for the early career phase. Um, so I'm going to comment on that and say that, yes, while our focus uh, within ESPO is primarily focused on early career, we define it, as I said, as a student or transitional member. We do have several um, programming in place that I think would be much of interest to the mid-career folks. Um, one is related to the expansion of the dissertation writing group. 
uh, we don't have yet the deadline for sort of uh, dates of when that would be rolled out, but this will be open to anybody um, who is a member of GSA. Um, and so we're just going to use the format that has been successful for our early career folks and sort of expand that out and get additional supports to have that writing program going because obviously uh, publishing is a big part of uh, being in an academia. Uh, and then an additional program that we have is currently is we're working with the GSA Career Consultancies, I think it's called, uh, which uh, um, I think we just did a webinar focusing on mentorship. And that has opportunities for uh, sort of mid-career members to mentor in a more formal setting um, in the sort of in the, for those of us who are in the earlier stages of the career. Uh, I think those are the two opportunities I'm thinking of. Uh, what about you guys? For mid-career researchers, um, I'm not sure, and I, I think it is a really valid point that there has been more and more focus on the early careers. Um, as Beth said, we it is following your own sort of definition of what career stage you fall into. I can see how that would be extra tricky if we, you know, did it across the continuum. But it, it would be fantastic to have more initiatives and more support for all of the stages. But I would also argue that perhaps the early one is the one that needs, you know, you need the most support and to get running, to get started. So, um, yeah, but agree that it would be great to also have some more mid-career support. I think, I think too, it's not necessarily, things that are not necessarily um, branded or whatever promoted in that way. Um, as being support specific to um, mid-career stage, but that we do have many things. If you remember in that bottom left corner of the, the sort of types of professional interest areas in iStart where we had the um, peers and we had the, the AWARE PIA, which deals with um, women professionals in Alzheimer's research and diversity and disparities, the three of our groups tend to do more of that professional and personal development that I do think would be applicable across career stages and is, and is open to um, others. In other words, we don't say um, to attend our webinars, you should be only be an early career researcher. If it's of interest to you, you can attend. Um, AWARE, for example, I know does a lot of webinars about um, for example, they just did one about, you know, promoting your uh, pr self-promotion. How do you self-promote, essentially? It's something that a lot of us are uncomfortable with, but we need to do. And so how do you go about that? Um, both AWARE and Diversity and Disparities have mentoring breakfasts um, or lunches. I, I suppose it has varied over the years. When we meet in person at AAIC um, and then last year it was handled um, remotely. And so they've done sort of um, mentoring sessions where you get put in, in small groups, essentially, um, where you can meet people who are early career, people who are more mid or more advanced career and sort of talk together. So I think those are still opportunities for mid-career folks, even though they may not be branded in quite that way. Um, but but I agree, you know, I think it's a very, it's very important to realize that there are different career issues at different stages and we should be attending to those. So if you have ideas, I'm sure all of us would like to hear um, how we can better support mid-career folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good points, guys. Um, thanks, quite. I know there's been a bit of a chatter in there, so. Maybe it's already been answered, but um, they've been asked about if she's uh, if she's a current member of ISTAR and they have not gotten a chance to involve. How can I get involved? Um, for me personally, um, I didn't understand like when you when I joined ISTAR um, last year um, because of the free conference and the 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 draw of the I always wanted to join. Uh, I didn't realize that that you can sign up and sort of indicate different PIAs that you're part of. Um, and then you get all the emails that are associated with that. Um, so I think there's like a one little extra step. Um, anything to add that we haven't talked about in terms of uh, additional opportunities to get involved in I start? 
I think that covers it. And it look, I mean, it looks like Nayara put the, the link to, to join peers directly in the chat. Um, so hopefully that's, that should be the link that goes and shows you like, once you're a member, you can sign up for these interest groups. Um, and then, yeah, exactly as Darina said, then, then you'll be plugged in with getting the communications from those groups and you'll have a clearer sense of how to get involved. If there's something that you're particularly interested in though, I, you know, I don't think that you need to wait for the, the email from that interest area to come out. You can look up, there's a way in each professional interest area to, to look up who the executive committee is. Um, and then you may be able to contact them if there's something you're particularly interested in helping with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I applied um, one time for the leadership the executive position and that the application was very straightforward and um, easy to fill out. Um, there was a few comments about the and the virtual conference. Um, I think that's been answered. Um, Hannah Mori asked, do you have any recommendations for the earliest early uh, researchers? So those of us who are still in coursework, we're interested in getting involved, but not ready for substantial leadership roles. Uh, good question. So um, in terms of GSA, uh, we, have, we have different tiers, I would say, of membership involvement. I would say sort of the lowest uh, time commitment tier is to be a member of a task force. Um, and that is that could be arranged at any time. You don't have to wait for the open call of volunteers. We're always looking for folks. And you can see our roster um, is quite big. Um, and so what we would do is we would plug you in into a task force and then you just um, take it from there. And task forces, some of them meet throughout the year, some of them meet only a certain time. So we can help guide you in terms of um, time commitment and which of the task forces and plus your personal preference, um, you know, we can sort of help you plug in that. And then the next, so I would say my recommendation for somebody like you would be to look into become a member of a task force. And then if you're looking for, once you sort of get a flavor of it, um, sort of how, what happened to me once I got a flavor of what it was like to be on a task force, then I led the task force and then I, you know, um, applied for an executive leadership position. So there's, there can be sort of like a step ladder, ladder <laughs> approach to this. And we have different levels of um, uh, involvement. I would say for peers, it's very similar and we would absolutely love to have you involved. Um, and it depends on how involved you want to be. So if, if for example, you would like to um, be involved in webinars, then perhaps um, you could get in touch and start um, express an interest in moderating a webinar, or if you already have some research that you've conducted, you could um, do a short presentation or a method that you'd like to present. And that'd be a really good way for you as well to get exposure and to get practice of presenting your research, but also to, you know, get that connection with um, the more senior researcher who will come and do the Q&A with others that will come um, to see the webinar. Um, so that's also really good for you and for the, the network. Um, other ways, if that is not something that you're interested in at the moment, would be to um, express an interest in working on the survey, for example. So we're currently developing that survey, but that's going to need to be disseminated. Um, and then there will also be a report based on the findings from that. And that will be a big collaborative work. Um, one thing that I would suggest is to attend, if you are coming to AIC, definitely pop into the scientific lunches. Um, there'll be more of a feeling of what's going on there. Um, and if not, there's the virtual business meeting in September, I believe, um, where we'll be discussing where we're at with the projects now, but also the upcoming projects. So you can express an interest in the existing ones, or you could also bring your own ideas to the table if you have something else that you'd like to put in the mix. Mm -hmm. One other thing that I know specifically we're very interested in, um, in getting some volunteers for is um, at Neuroscience Next, we're going to be continuing with a series that we've been calling uh, Realistic Resumes. And so this is the idea that, you know, there's a story behind the resume, right? There's a story behind the story that we tell publicly, which is what's the real, what were all the failures and what was the true story and how did you overcome hardships? 
And so the idea there has been to get, um, again, more advanced career um, folks to come in and give this background, but with the session being hosted and moderated by an early career researcher. So that's another thing um, that, that would be a very like a one-off way to get involved, you know, a very time limited commitment. And I will just say one other thing um, because I have been quite involved in the professional interest areas. Um, so I'm also involved very heavily in the vascular cognitive disorders, PIA and mm -hmm. diversity and disparities. And as a student several years ago, as a PhD student, I'm currently a postdoc. Um, I got involved by attending just a scientific meeting at AAIC that was affiliated with the Vascular Cognitive Disorders, PIA. And then we decided after that meeting that we wanted to write up essentially the proceedings of that session. And I was a co-author on that paper and I volunteered to lead up uh, the writing of a certain section, you know, I'm an epidemiologist by training. And so I said, I'm going to, I'll volunteer to write up the epidemiology of this particular thing that we were looking at. And I'll take the lead on that. So that's another way to be involved. You can be a co-author, you could be a lead of a certain writing section, and that would also be a more time limited way to be involved. And then correct me if I'm wrong, the, the AIC conference this summer will take place in Denver, Colorado. Is that right? Okay. That's right. It was originally, um, we were planning for the Netherlands, um, and we had been planning for the Netherlands last year as well, but um, with COVID and travel restrictions, um, it, it needed to be moved. And so the decision was made to move the in-person portion for this year to Denver, Colorado. And then also there is the virtual um, portion as well. So you can attend either way. Right. And uh, thankfully, the conferences do not coincide. Um, so <laughs> believe, right. uh, they're a few weeks apart. So, um, so that, that is great, because sometimes they do. Um, so with that, um, any additional last uh, comments before we wrap up from you, Beth or Nayara? I just, I just really encourage you all um, to, to follow your interests. It's very exciting to see people who are really interested in um, being involved and who um, have you know, new ideas. So um, get in touch with, with any of the three of us who've been talking on this call and we'd love to chat with you more if you, if you think of additional questions later. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, I speak for all of us that are volunteering um, and, uh, and we're all members of both organizations. Uh, so volunteering and being um, and being on the and having an ability to really help early career scholars across both of our organizations have been um, tremendously helpful. So this was meant to be uh, more of an informative um, session and more sort of an overview of the different programming we have. So hopefully um, this will encourage you to get in touch with us and to think about what kind of um, leadership opportunities do you want to be involved in. So with that, um, I hope you have a great rest of your Monday um, afternoon or evening for some of us. Um, and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your week. Stay safe. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you.